Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome to Williamstown First Baptist Church. For those of you just finding us on YouTube, we are located in Williamstown, Massachusetts, in the northwest corner of the state, right near New York and Vermont. And we're glad to have you here with us this morning, either in person or on the internet. Uh, before we begin, however, I have some, I, I, I'm sad to have to report a shocking and disturbing development here at Williamstown First Baptist. Uh, some rascal is attempting to steal the paint right off of our church. They've got it <laughs> scraped down and they're in the process of carting it away. So I don't know who is responsible for that, but we're going to find out and the innocent shall be prosecuted. So, but no, uh, we are delighted to have with us today uh, the folks from Ridgecrest Baptist in Dothan, Alabama. Uh, thank you so much, friends, for joining us this morning. We're glad to have you here, Pastor Chuck and uh, another Pastor Chuck, that is. Um, but thank you so much for being here. We're looking forward to our time of fellowship later. Uh, but for right now, let us begin our worship service today with our call to worship this is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. It's on page 1003 in our Pew Bibles. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for this time of refreshing and renewal, of rejoicing together, and of cementing our bonds of love and Christian fellowship. Father, keep us focused today on the things that are eternal. Let no influence of the enemy cloud our service or our minds or hearts here this day so that we can be ever truthful, ever faithful, and ever moving forward in our walk with you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Friends, if you'd stand and join me, we're going to begin our song service this morning for that great hymn of the faith, I'll Fly Away. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away when. I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. When the shadows of this life have gone, I'll fly away. Like a bird from prison bars has flown, I'll fly away. Fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away. To a land where joy shall never end, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When 
I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Thank you, dear friends, and if you'll take a seat, we're going to ask Pastor Chuck Locke to come up and uh, offer our corporate prayer this morning. Thank you, Tom. And when Pastor Chuck and Tom asked me, can you come up and speak, and I just almost had to smile. Well, of course I can. I'm a pastor, so actually I can come up and speak. Before I pray, though, thank you for allowing us to partner with you and for being such extraordinary host. And your hospitality and generosity have, all, have already become a great blessing in our lives and really the anticipation to further partner with you guys, Tom, it, it causes us to worship and to do that in spirit and truth. Brothers and sisters in Christ is a cliche, I think, probably in church circles, but for a great reason. It's kindred spirits, amen? And so with that in mind, I would like to offer a prayer uh, this morning as we continue to worship. So would you pray with me? Father, our Creator, Jesus, our Redeemer, Spirit that is wholly our encourager, we enter now, Father, into a time that we, I pray, endeavor to give you all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would eliminate distractions in our minds and hearts and allow us to fully take in who you are and, Father, what you are doing in our lives individually and collectively. Father, I thank you for family that goes beyond culture or ethnicities, but Father, that family, because of the commonality we share through the blood of Jesus Christ, our King, our Redeemer and Savior and lover of our souls. So it's because of him that we enter now asking your favor, not only on us as we gather, but Father, throughout bodies of believers in this area and throughout the United States, but Father, worldwide, that the name above all names, that the name of Jesus Christ be lifted high and worshiped alone, and that, Father, you would use us here this morning to be great ambassadors of that name throughout this day, and the days you had up ahead of us. We thank you now that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Chuck. You know, it's funny, friends, as I was making the uh, 20 or 25 mile drive over here this morning, I happened to tune in to a, ra a Christian radio station that I had never heard before. And it kind of surprised me, and uh, the brother that was, that was on the air at the time was preaching out of the book of Acts. And he was talking about the church at Antioch and their, their missionary zeal at the church at Antioch. And he, he said something that struck me in, in, in light of our, our meeting this morning. And he said that a church is a tool. A church is a tool, and that tool has to be sharp, it has to be ready, and it has to be willing to be used by the Holy Spirit. Can you relate? Amen. So we would just like to thank our friends from Ridgecrest in that regard that they are indeed ready and willing and sharp so that they might be used by the Holy Spirit in this endeavor. So thank you, Brother Chuck, and all of you who are joining us this morning. We appreciate your time, your treasure, and your talents. God bless you. If you stand and join me, we're going to continue our song service this morning. Another great old hymn of the faith, I Surrender All. All 
to Jesus, I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender To Jesus I surrender, humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender. to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Make me Savior, holy Thine. May Thy Holy Spirit fill me. May I know thy power divine. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus. I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender. To Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender He walks 
with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known I'd stay in the garden with him though the night around me be falling but he bids me go through the voice of woe his voice to me is calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known We are one in the spirit we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land and they'll know we are Christians by our love by our love yes they'll know we are Christians by our love we will work with each other we will work side by side we will work with each other we will work side by side and will guard each one's dignity and save each one's pride and they'll know we are christians by our love by our love yes they'll know we are christians by our love all praise to the Father from whom all things come and all praise to Christ Jesus his only Son and all praise to the Spirit who makes us one and they'll know we are Christians by our love by our love yes they'll know we are christians by our love amen and please be seated and please turn to page 627 in your pew bibles and this morning we'll be looking at jeremiah chapter 1 and verses 1 through 9 Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 1 through 9 and as we were working yesterday I realized the Lord had gone ahead and selected this text we have 
Uh, so many young people here this morning from Ridgecrest, and let me say, we were very impressed by you, you all uh, as young men and women of the Lord. You keep on doing what you're doing, and the Lord will bless you greatly. Um, it is a wonderful thing not only to see you working so hard, but to doing it together, enjoying each other's company. I love your choice of music. Uh, 80s or so, I heard Lionel Richie, I heard the Eagles. Uh, boy, I tell you, you can come worship here anytime. <laughs> um, it, it is amazing. Somebody said to me, they liked oldies too. And I said, yeah, the trouble is, in my life, oldies were from the 50s and 60s. <laughs> and so, a little bit different. Uh, than what we have here. But I said, I saw the Lord's hand. We have so many young people, and Jeremiah, we're told in this passage, was a youth when he was called. And so I think the message in great part is intended uh, for the young people here this morning, and those of us who are older can listen in and be reminded of what God has done in our lives. Be encouraged by it. Uh, it's an amazing thing when you look back on your life and see the hand of God. It was last October when eight people walked in, as we said yesterday, from Ridgecrest, sent here by another pastor. Uh, and from that, uh, you all are here today. And a word of thanks to Johnny Fain, and uh, as you have been faithful in coming, and as Tom said, sharing all that you have with us, so Johnny was faithful as well and has been a faithful servant for a long time. Uh, and so there are threads all along the way. Uh, and looking at this passage, you'll be able to see that today in your own life. So let me read the passage, verses 1 through 9 in Jeremiah chapter 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests, who are in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Wiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. And then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Let's bow our heads. Father, as always, we need you to take this text now and proclaim it to our hearts, trusting that you've prepared those hearts to receive the message you wish to give to it, whether to critique, uh, to encourage, to comfort, to challenge. We pray the word this morning would be a saving word for those who don't know you, and for those who do, such as ourselves who profess you, Challenge the reality, Lord, of that faith, that truth. Make sure that when we leave this place, we are indeed children of the living God. We pray that you'll do these things not for our sake, but for the sake of your great name, that it might be magnified here in Williamstown, in Dolphin, and as Chuck said, all around the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
you all, if you're a young person or an older person, you have a history. You know, one of the great things about scripture is that it, gr it grounds everything in history. It's a factual book. It gives us facts that can be checked. There are those in my own family who dismiss the Old Testament in particular as the writings of someone who wished to encourage those around him, and it was their interpretation of events at the time. But the Old Testament literature does not allow that option. And those who believe that it is simply a compilation of myth and letters of encouragement are not being intellectually honest. They need to follow the science. A phrase that has become common now, but too little followed by those who proclaim it. Because they will dismiss facts that they are uncomfortable with, dislike, or dislike the logical outcome of a truth. And so the Bible is a book of truth. Jeremiah had a history. The son of Hilkiah, one of the priests, and Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came. His family had been disgraced. He had an ancestor that Solomon opposed Solomon and suffered for it. He was of a priestly family, yes. You may be of a Christian family this morning, but you may have things in your past in your family. I don't know of any family, too many families that don't. If you go back through your family tree, you will find things there that you might be embarrassed about, might not wish to talk about. I'm older, and so the people I'm talking about are now long deceased. But my great-grandmother once took my grandmother and ran off from her husband from this county about 60 miles west to Albany. Amazing thing, if you consider when this was. I don't know all the details, but it's certainly not something that we talk about or try to understand. We all have a history. We all have a history, and the history here is of a kingly history. Josiah, Ammon, Wyakim, Zedekiah, all of the lineage of David. And so they had difficult things, but they came from a professing Christian family, if you will. And yet, if you go deeper, what you see is that the kings here, except Josiah, were not good kings. Only Josiah followed the Lord with all his heart. The rest, as we saw in Psalm 50, either gave lip service to it. They were going through the motions because that's what they had been taught. I was raised Roman Catholic. I can go into a Roman Catholic church today. I was in that church for 30 years of my life, and I can repeat without hesitation every single thing that needs to be said. But that doesn't make it right nor true. You all have been taught how to pray. You've been taught what to say and what not to say. And down south, it sounds a lot more gracious than it does up here in the north. Bless you, brother. I just love that accent. I like listening to Alistair Begg. I think he was an ancestor somehow of all the people in the South. See, now what happens when you make smart remarks is you lose track. <laughs> and so he was of a kingly family. And there's a history here if you know your scripture, and one of the things we need to do when we read scripture is compare a text to the rest of scripture. And we can see by the timeline here that Jeremiah would serve for over 40 years. Where will you all be 40 years from now? And will you have served faithfully? <laughs> We don't know. When I was 20, about Jeremiah's age, I could never have predicted that I would be here this morning doing this 
proclaiming God's word. Because what happened to Jeremiah happened to me. The word of the Lord came to me and changed my soul. And so this phrase here is the one that gripped me and the one that I wanted to talk about this morning. The word of the Lord came to me. Why did that grip me? It's because of who the Lord is. If you look in that text, you'll be reminded that that's the covenant name of our God. When Moses asked, who shall I say sent me? Tell them that I am who I am. Yahweh in the Hebrew. Yahweh. Yahweh sent me. It's the word of that God, the covenant God, the one who came to Moses and then established a covenant with the people of Israel. You find you begin in, with the Ten Commandments. How does it begin? I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. I have brought you out of the land of Egypt. I have brought you out of bondage. Therefore you shall. I had a professor who said, basically what God is saying is, I am God and you are not. And this is what you shall do. And he gives the Ten Commandments. And I have to say, and I've said it, the commandments are not such, so much commandments as they are a testimony of God's character. And what God's doing is he's trying to raise up children in his image. And if we follow those commandments, we have commandments, rules, regulations that our parents give us. And what they're trying to do is raise up children in their image if they're Christians. And so God, good father that he is, gave us a set of rules. So God is our covenant God. But he's more than that. And Moses took pains to identify him as not only a covenant God, but the, the creator God. Remember at the time of the Exodus, the people, like our society now, our culture now, worshipped many gods, attributed their livelihood, their lives to many gods. And what Moses took pains to say, and he took 50 chapters to do it, because he wrote it after the people were brought out of Egypt, he wrote the book of Genesis, to tell them exactly who the God was that had saved them and what his relationship to that salvation was. Think of your own lives. When you were born, you didn't know your parents. It was only after you were born that you came to know your parents. And the longer you lived with them, the more you knew them, mother and father. And so it is with God. When we come to God, frequently we are totally ignorant of who God is. You say, but wait a minute. Certainly Jeremiah knew he was of a family of priests. Yes, he had a lot of head knowledge. I was shocked one day to read in the commentary in the book of Leviticus that the book of Leviticus was the very first book that young Jewish men memorized. I said, Leviticus? Why Leviticus? And it was because in Leviticus, God explained how to draw near to him, what you had to do in order to have a relationship with him. Much as Elena and I, have, as some of you have heard, we had a seven hour date, our only date. Not to be recommended when you're 20, we were 60. <laughs> What did we do? We talked about everything that we could talk about that we thought might be an issue or a problem. We were honest with each other, one with another. And so we did that because we wanted to draw near to each other. And we weren't going to do that unless we knew if it was possible. Well, when you read the book of Leviticus, God is telling a sinful people how they can have a relationship with him. And so they memorized the book of Leviticus. 
So yes, Jeremiah knew the Bible. When I came to faith in Christ, I knew about the Bible. And one of the things that shocked me, because once I started preaching, whenever I went into a Protestant church, I just assumed everyone knew their Bibles. And sometimes that's true. But sometimes we know a lot, but it doesn't make its way down to our heart. Sometimes we're Christians in word only. We've learned all the right things to say. We can fool our parents. We can fool our friends. We can fool everybody but the Lord of the word. And there will come a time, I promise you, if the Lord has you in his heart, the word of the Lord will come to you. Notice it's a passive. It comes to you. It's not something that you choose for yourself. It's God Almighty who determines who his children are. I did not choose my natural father, my natural mother. I was born. It happened to me. When you're born again, it happens to you. It comes to you. It comes in power. And here this young man from a priestly family, all of a sudden, he knew the Torah. Of course he knew the Torah. But all of a sudden, he knew the God of the Torah. And there's a huge difference. I knew all about Elena. I could have told you factually about her. Now I know Elena. I've walked through life with her. I've experienced her reactions to things in life. I know her. And so Moses took great pains to say, this is our creator God as well as our covenant God. And yes, indeed, he's an electing God. He is the one in charge of all things. The word of the Lord came to me. What did he say? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. In the Hebrew, same as intimacy between a man and a woman, knew you in that way. Psalm 139, before there's a word on my lips, you know it. I can't flee anywhere from your presence. You know where I am. You know what I'm doing. You see my heart, not just my body and where it's at. You see my emotions, my motives, my thoughts, everything you see about me. Before I formed you, I knew you and I consecrated you. The Greek translation uses the same word. We get the word saint, holy, set apart, chose, elected. I chose you. If you're here this morning, it's because God chose you to be here, first of all. One of my favorite verses is, the lot falls into the lap, but it's every decision is of the Lord. I used to lean on that before I was a Christian. I knew the Bible, but I didn't know the Lord. I'd buy one lottery ticket a week. I've got to give the Lord a chance, right? The lot falls into the lap. Maybe this is a lot he wants me to have, so I might be wealthy. You're here because God wants you here this morning. Yes, it was because of Johnny Fane. Yes, it was because of your parents. But God is in charge of everything. He can move a king's heart. He can move a river wherever he wants. He can take one and set him up as president or king and tear down another. God is in charge of everything. He knows the names of the stars. He knows your name. And he has you here to hear this word this morning, to have this experience here. What will he do with it? I don't know. That's both the exciting and the scary part of God. You walk by faith, not by certainty. Well, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen if I go to that school. I don't know what's going to happen. Once I start playing baseball again, my leg will hold up basketball. I don't know what I'm going to take for a class. God knows. God knows. You just go and you ask 
and you make the best choice that you can. You go. He's an electing God. I knew you. I consecrated you. I set you apart. This is what he's saying to Jeremiah. And I appointed you a prophet to the nations. I have something for you to do. You mean today, Lord? Uh, maybe. I was a finance director, accountant, computer information person for 32 years. And God used that to prepare me to do this. So college is only a piece of the journey. And it's not even the academics as much as it is the relationships and the growth that you'll have as you go through trials and times of problems. That's where God grows you. Look in Psalm 119 in one area three times. It's good that I have been afflicted. Good that I've been afflicted that I might learn your law. We see the same thing in the New Testament. Count it all joy when you suffer affliction and all of these things. God is working in you. Are you afraid this morning? You're in good company. Afraid of the future? You're in good company. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. What did God say to Jeremiah? Jeremiah, I can't do this. Lord God, behold, I'm only a youth. That excuse is not just from being young. Moses was 80 when he said the same thing. I can't speak. I'm afraid. For every one of us here, we go out into this world. We're called on to evangelize, to preach, teach, live before people. We're afraid, afraid of the response, especially in a community like this that doesn't hold to our values, doesn't follow our God, doesn't love his word. We're called to live in these places. Are you afraid? Yeah, I'm afraid too sometimes. We walk by faith. We don't walk because we think we're the ones doing it. Jeremiah, I am going to come. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to anoint you. And I want you to speak to people. If you can see on the bulletin, the last point in this section is relational God. God wants us to speak to others so that they can come in and have a relationship with him. That's the whole point of our lives. And part of what we all have done is shared that relationship as brothers and sisters in Christ. What a marvelous day it was yesterday. And it wasn't just the work, it was the conversation. It was getting to know each other. It was hearing about when you were saved, how you got together, what God's doing in your lives, just graduated. All these things to get to know you, to encourage. Oh, I remember, or I, you go ahead, you do that. I had that same problem. You know, and it's easier sometimes listening to somebody up here in Massachusetts than it is to go back to Dothan and have to listen to the people there, but when you hear the same thing in both places, a smart person is going to say, maybe there's something to this. I'm hearing this in liberal New England, and I'm hearing this in conservative Alabama, both saying the same thing about Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Someone said to me when I was about to prepare this sermon, you need to bring your A game today. I understood what he meant. I was an athlete at one time in my life, football, baseball. I could have told you all the players on the Red Sox, their batting averages. Who batted what? Who? Ty Cobb, 367, highest batting average ever. See, some of it's still up there. Which ought to not so much amaze you as feel pity for me. Just because I can do well at Jeopardy doesn't mean I can live as a Christian. And there's a lot of junk up there. God is a relational God. He is taking Jeremiah and he wants to send Jeremiah to his people because he wants to have a relationship with them when he brought them out of Egypt. What did he say? 
Jeremiah tells them in the 11th chapter, I command you to your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, listen to my voice, do all that I command. Why? So you shall be my people, and I will be your God. And more than that, it's not just that we have a king, kingly relationship with him as his subjects. Let them make me a sanctuary, the tabernacle, so that I might dwell with them. And so our covenant God, our creator God, has been choosing a people to be his children so that he might have a relationship with them, dwell among them. And when that didn't happen in Eden, because the kids didn't listen, and they did what should not have been done and broke that relationship, Their father just didn't discard them and say, I'll start again. He began a process of redemption. And it starts in Genesis 3. But he needed someone to tell people about that. See, God reveals himself to us in the same way we reveal ourselves to others. What we do, what we say. And God created this world And the psalmist says, if you look around and you say there's no God, you're a fool. You're a fool. Because everything testifies to me. If you truly follow the science, if you truly follow the truth, it will point to God. And then he reveals himself by his words. Because the sky doesn't tell us why. We see Jesus hanging on the cross. Why did he do that? We need words. We need someone to speak those words, to explain it. And God throughout scripture has appointed people to speak his word. He appointed Moses. Moses passed the word on along. And in this last time we're told, God, who had spoken by the prophets, spoke to us by his Son, who is the Word of God. He came. He lived. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He wants a relationship with each one of us. And so Jeremiah was given that appointment, and then he was equipped to do it. See, what happened in Jeremiah's time is the same thing that's happening in our time. Jeremiah chapter 2, the people were having trouble. People today are having trouble. Trouble in their cultures. And what happened then, in the time of their trouble, God said to them through Jeremiah, Where are your gods that you made for yourself? Let them arise if they can save you. For as many as your cities are your gods, O Judah. You all as young people are going to encounter more and more people who have gods that are not Yahweh. It's as simple as that. And you're going to have to grapple with what to say to them. How to interact with them. A lot of it is going to be based on how you suffer. Jeremiah was called a weeping prophet. He suffered not only because of being in a stockade, which he was, or throwing down, thrown down a big pit, but because it broke his heart to see what was happening to God's people. And so, if we're going to be Christians, that's a part of what we're going to experience. It's a part of what you will. And as I see you all here, that breaks my heart. I'd love to, often wonder why God just didn't take me to heaven when he saved me. Be a whole lot easier, right? A lot better. Dry every tear, lie and lay down with the lamb. I'd love to do that. Love love animals. All of those things. No death anymore. Losing those I love. But God didn't do that. Because in order for us to love like God, We have to have the heart of God. And in order to have the heart of God, 
we have to have a broken heart. We have to be willing to go through anything for those that we love. You're going to get married, young men, love your wives as Christ loved the church, and what? Gave himself for it. Gave himself, died. You're going to be a Christian? You need to take up your cross and follow Jesus. And so if we're going to be like God, we have to know God's word and be willing to say to people who disagree because not only do people believe this, worse, preachers believe it. Back then, the prophets were prophesying falsely. The priests were ruling at their direction. And the people in the pews loved to have it so. But God said to them, what are you going to do when the end comes? Many of our churches, and you've passed one down the street, do not proclaim the word of God. They simply do not, and the people love to have it so. And why is that? Because they've rejected the word of God. We went through Psalm 50 a few weeks ago, and I love Psalm 50 because God comes as a judge First words in the first sentence are in the Hebrew, El Elohim Yahweh. And I always pictured them saying, All rise, his honor, El Elohim Yahweh, now presiding. And he calls his people to him. Our God comes, he does not keep silent. He calls to the heavens above, to the earth, that he may judge his people. For God has judged himself. And one of the indictments was, what right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips because you hate discipline and you have cast my words behind you? And that's what people do. If you don't want to listen, if you don't want to hear it, you just throw it behind you, disregard it. One of the reasons I went to school and learned Hebrew and Greek because when somebody said to me, that's not what the word says, I would say, yes, it does. And you cannot refute that. You either have to believe it or ignore it. Those are your two options. And that's it. And so Jeremiah is facing a same people. Whom shall I speak to? He said, their ears are uncircumcised. They cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord is to them an object of scorn, and they take no pleasure in it. And behold, They've rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom is in them? And you know, I know, that wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord, the Lord of the word. So, I have a word there in Spanish. Contigo. It means with you. I love that. When you find a word in another language, you know, you can get somebody's attention with that. If I said, God's with you, you've heard that before. So it just kind of, but if I say, contigo, I say, what did he say? With you. With you. You know, Jeremiah was going to have a lot to deal with, and God said in verse 8, don't be afraid. I am with you, contigo. I am with you. Now stop for a minute and think. I'm not going to ask which one of you guys is the strongest. Maybe have to have an arm wrestling match after to figure out. So, you know, figure out who the strongest is. And now all of y'all that are not as strong, you know, what if he could walk around with you all the time? Hey, you got a problem with me? Talk to him. And that's what we say as Christians. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to bless you even though you're persecuting me. I'm going to pray for you even though you're despitefully using me. You go talk to my father. God is with you. Nothing will happen to you ever that God does not permit and then use for a purpose. So contigo, I am with you, declares the Lord. 
and then he puts his words in his mouth. Well, so how does that affect you and me? Is that still true in this New Testament era? God still work the same way? Whenever we have a Bible study, you know, people make a comment to me, I say, prove it. Prove it by Scripture. Prove it by the Word. If you can't say what you're saying is backed up by Scripture, you ought not say it. Are we, each of us, can we say that the word of the Lord came to me? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, not of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. The word of the Lord came to you. If you're born again, the word of the Lord came came to you. And when that word comes, we're told in Ephesians that God adopts us into his house. We're told that he blesses us with his spirit, that he redeems us, that he has a place prepared for us and he's going to bring us there. Ephesians chapter 1, all one sentence in the Greek, verses 3 through 14. Read it, memorize it. That's what God's going to do for you. That's what God's going to do for you. You are now his child. He chose you. Just as certainly as he chose Abraham. Fear not, Abraham. That's what God said. These things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. 109 times the word of the Lord came is used in scripture. And when that word comes, it comes in power. Because God uses that word. Romans were told that we should renew our minds by the word. We're told that God is working in us to will and do his good pleasure. How does he do that? By his word. Call to worship. The word of God is living active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul, spirit, joints, marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. When you read the word, God speaks to you. And he works in you to make you, to mold you. Paul said, I'm confident of this, that God will complete that work in you. He will continue to work in each one of you. You can't feel it. You don't know it except when you look back. I didn't know when I met Johnny Fain that we'd be sitting here this morning with everybody, with y'all. I hate to keep saying that, feel like I'm being a smart guy, but I didn't know. You don't know. It's only by looking back. I didn't know that one day, Many years ago when the Lord saved me and I had so much junk in my head, I determined I was going to read the Word. I was going to do what was suggested to me by Billy Graham. You read five chapters of Psalms every day, one chapter of Proverbs. I know people here in the congregation have heard that. But Psalms teaches you how to interact with God, Proverbs with men, how to speak, to speak honestly, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Ever felt like that? We're to say, open our hearts, let God in. And so the word is what came and it changed me and it cleansed me. It made me what I am. But did I know back then God was going to use that reading of his word so that one day I could preach and it would be there for me and the spirit would take what I had put inside my heart I heard on the radio this morning, maybe it was listening to David Jeremiah, I'm not sure, a man was laid up bedridden for three months, and so he determined what he was going to do was memorize 107 verses of the Sermon on the Mount. Memorize? I ask Siri. But see... Meditating on the word is like chewing on something. You get the nutrient. You've got to do that. And God, therefore, after he gives us birth, he trains us up by using that same word. 
And just as it was said in Deuteronomy, these words I command you today shall be on your heart. They're the words that God has given by his scripture, all breathed out by God. Second Timothy says, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness, that the man of God, woman of God, might be complete, equipped for every good work. So God gives you his word. And tell me of your best friend. And don't you talk with them in order to know them? You know, guys don't until they get older. Hopefully they learn it sooner rather than later. Guys don't share too much of their, at least in my generation. You know, we were, we had the John Wayne model, you know. Hit me on the cheek. Give me another. Don't, don't say it hurts. Don't say your heart is broken. Don't say I'm fearful. Don't say that. And that's a wrong model. Jesus Christ was the strongest man that ever lived. And he poured out his heart before us. And he spoke to people. He learned how to speak to people in love. And you young girls, you find a man like that. Doesn't matter if he can kick a football 80 yards. Doesn't matter. You want somebody who's going to have your back for the rest of your life and who's going to share their heart with you for the rest of their life. When you have somebody like that, it's a tremendous blessing. Absolutely tremendous. And so God's word comes to us and he wants it in our lives. We've been appointed to tell others, yes, Pastors, preachers, preach the word. That's what Paul told Timothy in his last letter before he died, last chapter, most important thing that he could ever say to a pastor, preach the word. God has said that he has spoken his word. It will accomplish the purpose for which he sent it. When you stand up before a congregation, if you're going to be a preacher, you've got to preach the word. And you don't try and color it by the culture. You don't try and bend it. You don't try and avoid certain things. Because then you're using your words, and your words will not save. They might get you a congregation. You might be a great, talented speaker. And you might gather a following around you. And that's why Timothy was told to preach the word. Because he said the day is coming when people will not abide sound teaching. They'll gather to themselves teachers who will tickle their itching ears and they'll follow myth. And in this culture, that is already happening. But it's happened in every culture over history. People do not abide God telling them, you need me to die for you. And so Paul, he preaches the word crucified. He says, I preach Christ crucified. Why is that an offense? Because I am saying that you need something and you've got to ask for it. You've got to lay your pride down and say, I am needy. And I need God's help to be the man or woman that he wants me to be. And until the day you do that, you will be blown back and forth because you will be looking to your peers for your affirmation. You'll be looking to society, academics, promotions for your affirmation. What you want is the word of God. You want to know God loves you and he is the one you need to be affirmed by. And yesterday when I broke down, when I was praying, one of the reasons was God has had to work in me over 10 years. As I said, I'm an accountant. I judge success by numbers. And so numerically, I'm a failure. And Satan would say that every Sunday as I stood back there and prayed before I preached. And God would say, Chuck, you be faithful. You be faithful. And so don't let success determine who you are. Let Jesus determine it. If you're faithful to him, 
then you're like Martin Luther. I've said all I can. I'm going to stand on the word, and that's all I can do. When I was in Costa Rica, I took up this Bible, and I said, with this book, I am sufficient. I am sufficient. And one of the people down there after her says, that struck them. And I say, as I say to people who tell me, well, something struck me. Well, the Lord's speaking to you because that's not a particularly marvelous statement. It's the truth. And so we're appointed not only preachers, but also every single one of us. We're always to be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is in us. And then we're to explain that hope. We ex talk about Christ. We project Christ as salt and light. We walk in the light. We read through Ephesians. All the things we're supposed to be and do, we're supposed to avoid. Go through the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 and 17 into chapter 7. And we're told we can't be angry. We're not supposed to lust. We're not supposed to pray just perfunctorily. You know, you'll find that out if you get blessed with a wife or a husband. After a while, you, you know, you kiss your wife goodbye in the morning when you do that for the first year or two. It's really cool. <laughs> Let it be cool after 30 years, too. And not just something you do, something you mean. Something you mean. And not just from your spouse, you too. <laughs> Appreciate each other. Appreciate each other. So Matthew tells us that's how we're supposed to live. That's our testimony as Christians. What we do. And if we know the Lord, then not contigo, we know it better as Emmanuel. God with us. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you to every single Christian. So the message to Jeremiah is the same to every Christian today. And so the last thing I'll say is that what we're supposed to do always, we're supposed to give a reason for the hope that is in us. The hope that is in us. See, God wanted people. He wanted to be their God, them be his people. And he would dwell among them. And so what do we see at the end of the day? Well, Jeremiah talks in the great verse that we're well aware of, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel, not like the covenant I made before that they broke, even though I was their husband, relational. I was their husband. This is the covenant I'll make. I'll put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And then one day when we get to heaven, what we'll find is we hear a loud voice from the throne saying, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be their God. Same message from the front of the book to the back of the book. God wants a relationship with you. No matter what age you are today, you've been consecrated, set apart. You're a saint. You've been consecrated to tell others this word and tell others of this hope, regardless of the cost. And so it's the same for any one of us. And at the end of the day, each one of us has to go before our Father and say, okay, Dad, how did I do today? How would I do? Show me where I need to do better. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for your word. When all else fails, we have your word to speak to our hearts, to calm our fears, to encourage us, to correct us, to remind us that you love us and that you're with us and that you have a purpose for each one of us. And we pray, Lord, that we'll fulfill that purpose, that we will indeed be faithful 
regardless of what others say or think, even if we have to stand alone, we pray that we will be faithful so that one day when we see you in heaven, we'll hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Oh, please, yeah. oh, please remain seated. <laughs> Thank you, dear friends. Before we sing our last hymn, I just want to offer a couple of reflections. I got a couple of thoughts rattling around in my head here. I know you guys are anxious to get to the potluck. We are Baptists after all. <laughs> Amen. But one of the po first points that Chuck made this morning is that the Bible contains truth. The Bible contains truth. And I want, just want you to listen to something. I want you to listen once again to the first chapter of Jeremiah, the first, to the first paragraph. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests who are in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah in the 13th year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, and until the end of the 11th year of Je Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Wow. I want you to notice something, friends. I know, want you to notice what that does not say. It does not say once upon a time, amen, there are people, there are places, there are offices, there are times and dates, there are tribes mentioned. All of these things are factual. And if somebody wants to come to you and tell you that the Bible is a bunch of made-up myths, what I'd like you to do is to take them gently to the first chapter of Jeremiah and read that paragraph to them and ask them simply, would you please tell me what part of this is wrong? And if you believe it's wrong, where do you get your information? And the reason I mention that, dear friends, is that there's a connection between the Bible being historical mm -hmm. truth and the Bible being spiritual truth. If the Bible is reliable and trustworthy in the things that it asserts about history, then just maybe it can also be trusted in the things that it tells us about God's working in our lives. Yesterday was my spiritual birthday. It was 22 years ago this weekend that I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ in a hotel in Louisville, Kentucky. I had one of those conversion experiences that happened all of a sudden. And I have to tell you something, dear friends, I was not looking for God. Oh no. I was not looking for God. To describe to you the depravity that my life had become would in itself be sinful, so I won't try. All I can tell you is, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. I wasn't looking for God. God reached out and touched me and changed me in a moment of time, and I have not been the same since. So what's that mean? What's that mean for you? What does that mean for you and me? Well, if the Bible's truth, friends, then we can trust this thing, the thing that saved me, so that I was able to put my faith and trust in Jesus of Nazareth so many years ago. Here's the truth that I want to convey to you. You ready? God saves sinners. Did you feel like you had to get prettied up and cleaned up before you could come to God? Oh yeah, most of us felt like that, right? He's not going to take me, not in this condition. Uh-uh, 
No, 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 no. I'm going to have to start acting righteous. I might have to, like, start wearing a suit. You know, I might, I might have to, uh, you know, get rid of the girlfriend that I've been having on the side over here. You know, I might have to start um, uh, eliminating curse words from my vocabulary. Oh, yeah, I've got to get cleaned up before God's going to take me. Uh-uh. No. God saves sinners. Amen? Amen. 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 As a matter of fact, dear friends, God takes me and you just as I am. Would you please stand and sing? <clears throat> Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I come just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, I come broken to be mended, I come wounded to be healed, I come desperate to be rescued, I come empty to be filled, I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb, and I'm welcome with open arms, praise God, just as I am. as I am, I would be lost, but mercy and grace my freedom bought, and now to glory in your cross, O Lamb of God, I come. I come broken to be mended, I come wounded to be healed, I come desperate to be rescued, I come empty to be filled, I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb, and I'm welcomed with open arms praise god just as i am i come broken to be mended i come wounded to be healed i come desperate to be rescued i come empty to be filled i come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of christ the lamb and i'm welcomed with open arms praise god just as i Just as I am. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us so much, so much, that you would send your only begotten Son to broken, helpless, wicked, depraved sinners, that you would wrap your arms around us and draw us to you and fill us with your love, with your power, with the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ, with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the love that we share, not only for you, dear Lord, but for each other. Thank you, dear God. Thank you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. We'll see you in the fellowship hall.